Welcome to session two of the ESG Practice Playbook. We're speaking today with Paul Riccadella. He's the executive director and head of the wealth advisory team at MSCI. Hello, Paul. Hello. Nice to, uh, nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yes, thanks for joining us for this session. And we're going to jump right into the questions. 2020 was a year of mainstreaming of ESG indexes and the financial products that track them brought in over $75 billion in flows to ESG ETFs, shattering all previous records. So to what do you attribute this massive interest in ESG last year? Yeah, that, that is a great place to start. Obviously, uh, 2020 was a momentous year in a lot of different ways, and, and it was a great year for the ESG ETF industry. Flows were about triple the level in the U.S. that they were the previous record year, which was 2019, and about double the level in, uh, in Europe. So quite a pace. And I guess in my view, I attribute this to the confluence of three things. Um, the first just has to do with the ETF ecosystem. If you are a financial professional and you want to build an ESG globally diversified portfolio for your clients, by the time 2020 came around, you actually had the tools to do so. That wasn't necessarily the case in previous years. There were some important gaps in terms of ETF availability for ESG products. The um, second major thing just had to do with what we lived through in some of the news from last year. Obviously, the coronavirus pandemic impacted life in every way, fairly high stakes uh, presidential election in, uh, in the United States. And so the news was very much top of mind, especially with the pandemic. And I think it maybe caused people to think more about sustainability uh, and, and their practices. And then the last thing is performance. Um, 2020 was pretty good in terms of relative performance for ESG indexes. Most of them outperformed anywhere from about 75 basis points to 3% versus the cap-weighted parent indexes. And clearly, a positive performance kicker helps any trend. Great. Well, thank you for that opening remark. And now we're going to move on to some of the differences that we find in ESG investment through indexing. What are the different subcategories of ESG investment that MSCI sees going forward? So I'm going to use a slide for this one, Paul. Um, sure. At the moment, there are uh, three subcategories of ESG investment with an emerging fourth is the way I would characterize it. So starting in the middle with values here. Um, this is where the ESG industry started decades ago, and it's mostly about negative exclusion. An ESG investor finds certain activities objectionable. They screen out all companies engaged in those activities, and they keep everything that's left. A lot of the most popular screens when this first started were with respect to tobacco, alcohol, firearms, gambling things of that nature. And, and certainly screens have modernized in recent years to reflect more religious values and environmental values. Um, if you move to the left, integration is really where the industry is at right now, especially in the United States. And integration is much more of a focus on positive inclusion. So it's not about screening companies out because of the business that they're in. It is about gravitating to the best companies in each sub-industry, regardless of the business that they're in. And then on the far right here is impact investing. This has been mostly a private asset class phenomenon, but it is getting more popular in the public space. I personally define impact as a quantifiable outcome based on a certain dollar level invested and uh, and we are starting to see impact products and 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 investors are gravitating to it the emerging fourth category i would uh characterize as climate it's been quite popular in europe less mainstream 
in the United States. I do think that we will see uh, climate index launches and ETFs in 2021 so that the ecosystem is still building, but we're not quite there yet. So, Paul, can you explain the ESG research products that are used in constructing MSCI ESG indexes across all of these categories and also provide an overview of the most popular indexes with ETFs linked to them in the marketplace? Of course. So at the moment, there are three MSCI ESG products used in pretty much every index that has an ETF behind it on the marketplace. Uh, the first is the overall ESG rating. It's a triple A to triple C score, and it is sub-industry centric. And what I mean by that is that we compare companies relative to their sub-industry peers. At the moment, there are 158 different sub-industries. And the material key issues that we identify for each sub-industry vary quite significantly from one to the next. The way that we would look at a financial services company, for example, would be vastly different from the way we would analyze an oil and gas exploration company. But overall, it's a AAA to C rating. In each sub-industry, you're going to have some leaders, you're going to have some laggards, and you're going to have clustering towards the middle. The second product that's used is the controversy score. And this is a 0 to 10 quantification of how much controversy a particular company is embroiled in. And controversies come in many forms. In extreme form, for example, a decade ago would have been the BP oil spill. Less extreme forms uh, come with, you know, perhaps legal action being brought against the company by its employees, things of that nature. But at the end of the day, the controversy score quantifies all of that. And then the last research product used is the business involvement screen. And um, this goes back to this sort of initial founding of ESG. This is about identifying revenue streams from certain business activities that ESG investors might find objectionable and eliminating companies on that basis. And so if you look at the indexes, here are a few popular ESG indexes that have ETFs behind them with large asset bases. And on this next slide here is, uh, is the glossary for the exclusions. But what you will notice, Paul, about these indexes is that pretty much all of them are some sort of trade-off between the minimum ESG rating, the minimum controversy score, and then the number of exclusions in terms of business activities. And in addition to the trade-off between those three research areas, there is also a trade-off in terms of constraints, right? Because every ESG index wants to have some relationship to the cap-weighted parent index in terms of performance. And so an example of a constraint would be sector neutrality. And by virtue of an ESG index being sector neutral, you know that it's never going to deviate too, too far from the parent index in any given year. Another example of a constraint would be a specific and explicit tracking error constraint that based on the rules that ESG index can track no more than 50 or 100 basis points from the parent. And if we just move quickly from, from left to right here, um, you'll see that the, the choice ESG screened indexes the defining feature here really is the exclusions, as well as a fairly high minimum ESG rating. There are no constraints to speak of. Once you eliminate the stocks based on business involvement, controversy, ESG rating, it is a cap-weighted index. Uh, and the expectation here would be for significant tracking error. You know, let's call it three to 400 basis points. ESG leaders is uh, one of our more popular ESG indexes. And you can see here that the minimum rating is a, uh, a double B, so less strict than choice screened. Uh, the defining feature of this index is sector neutrality. That is the 
the major constraint, all of the sectors are going to be in line with MSCI USA, the cap-weighted parent. To the right of that is ESG extended focus. Now, this is built using optimization, which means that we use the bar risk model, which is an analytical tool that MSCI owns, and we use an optimizer to create this index. And the most important uh, aspect of it is a, an explicit tracking error constraint. So USA ESG extended focus will have a tracking error of no more than 50 basis points from the MSCI USA cap weighted parent in any given year. And so it's a, this is for advisors and clients who want an ESG profile, but are maybe concerned about the deviation from, uh, from their benchmark. To the right of that is ESG Select, um, which combines a lot of the different construction techniques that we've already discussed. The important feature here is the maximum number of stocks uh, that is unique to this index. And then finally, on the far right is the KLD 400. This is a generation one index. It's got a live track record of over 30 years. The financial product linked to it is quite popular. And, um, you know, the the most important feature of this index is that it starts with an all cap universe, whereas the other four start with a mid and large cap only universe. So, Paul, if I'm following your uh, explanation correctly here, uh, advisors can look to indexes and um, ETF strategies using those indexes when they have overweight and underweight concerns related to the specific client that they're working with. Is that accurate? That is exactly accurate. And I think the, the job of any advisor is to both understand their client's ESG preferences. Are they, is the client more concerned with negative exclusion or positive inclusion? And then the second major job of the advisor is to understand the constraints built into the index. How much is it going to deviate from the cap-weighted parent in a worst-case scenario? And, and what level of deviation can their clients absorb? Because at the end of the day, it's a, a trade-off between those two elements that define which option really is right for the client. Okay, so there is a, uh, a consideration when you're using um, any index, especially one that deviates from the standard, as you're suggesting, related to risk management uh, that has to be carefully considered by the advisor as well as the client, as I think that's what I hear you saying. What are their what are the differences or are there differences between the way indexes are used in the U.S. investment markets versus uh, the EU, for example? Well, in terms of ESG, I think ma the major differences are just the popularity of different um, products, right? In the U.S., it's been mostly about positive inclusion, right? Indexes like leaders and extended focus have sort of dominated flows and AUM. If you look to Europe, um, they have a much bigger climate change ETF market, for example. Um, they have, you know, more values-based products. And so I think it, the differences are really about investor preferences more than anything else and where individuals tend to allocate their money. Great. Well, Paul Riccadella, Executive Director and Head of Wealth Advisory Team at MSCI, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to join us today in Session 2 of the ESG Practice Playbook. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you for having me, Paul. Nice to be with you.